Charles, I gave you two long ones. Good job. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, send your spirit out amongst us that we could hear in your word what it is that you would have us here today, that we can respond to your promises and understand the world around us as according to the way that you have made it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So the gospel reading that Charles did there makes two important claims. There are really two important lessons in that two movements within the thing. There are part A, and there's part B. And often, we will focus on part B and ignore part A. Um, and part A is the idea that the world is going to be shaken. And part B is that people aren't going to know what any of that means while it's happening. Those are the two major ideas that Jesus comes forth. And both of these points have reverberated throughout history, through every single generation in the last 2,000 years, again and again without stop, since the time that he said them and since the time it was recorded here for people to read. In our introduction to the Gospels this month, in our questions um, series in Sunday School, the first one that we looked at was Mark. Uh, many believe that Mark is the first of the four Gospels, even though it's listed second in the New Testament. Many believe that it lays the foundation for the other two so-called synoptic Gospels, Matthew and Luke. Because there are 661 verses in the Gospel of Mark, and all but 31 of them are found in the other two. Um, but it's this Gospel, the Mark's Gospel, that moves quickly. It's the one that never slows down. It's the one that never takes a moment to explain a whole lot. It just goes from event to event. It goes from point to point. It goes from statement to statement. It goes from miracle to miracle. And it goes from riddle to riddle, almost. And here we see Jesus making claims about great changes that will take place. Cataclysmic changes apocalyptic change. And I want to take a moment to talk about the word apocalyptic, um, because it means more than what we usually attribute to it. Um, or it's actually, or possibly less. It's funny, it's like it's either more or it's less. I'm not sure which it is. Because um, simply it means hidden things. It means the hidden things. Apocalyptic, it comes from the word for covering. Apocalyptic. And A, you put the A in front of it, means without covering. So the thing that was covered and hidden all of a sudden has been revealed, without cover, revealed or uncovered. So it means simply the secret invisible world that we don't usually get to, to see. The thing that goes on behind the veil, behind the curtain. It's usually only known or seen by God, but it's coming to be known. It's coming to be seen. It's finally being observed. Now, of course, because of this, the connotation or the association with it is the end of the world. That the future is the uncovered thing, and this is uncovering that future, letting us see it. The cataclysm that comes later. The revealed example that we see in the New Testament books, especially in Revelation, which is where that word comes from. So sometimes we think it's more. It's more than just the hidden things. It's the most important hidden things. It's the things at the end. But it means more than just those things at the end. It means the other unseen, hidden, revealed truths about God's working in the world, especially through Jesus Christ, moment to moment. So it's about many other things than just the end of the world. And sometimes we would like to overlook those lesser things, blinded by that big, huge idea of the future. But I think we do so at our peril. When we look at the end and ignore the now, we need to recognize both. Because Matt Mark, in that way, not just this chapter, 
but the entire thing is an apocalyptic book. And not just because of this chapter, because of the entire thing. God is busting into history through Jesus Christ. The very idea that God has come, that God has come as Emmanuel, as Jesus, as the Son of Man, and is setting the captives free, is in itself an apocalyptic moment. If you were blind and now can see, that's an apocalypse. It's an apocalyptic moment for you. If you were a leper who was a healed, if you were a paralytic, if you were bleeding and touched the hem of Christ's garment and were healed, if you were on a boat with Jesus and he calmed the storm, if you were and saw multitudes fed just by a few loaves and fishes, if you were walking in the presence of God made flesh, all of that is apocalyptic. The hidden things coming true. The world is changing, the good news is being proclaimed, and it's not a tear down the Roman occupation type of good news, but instead a spiritual one about truth, the truth of God, the power of God that he has, eminent and real, but sometimes invisible and covered. And that invisible covered power is now being revealed through the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ comes proclaiming change. And this is part A, right? Part A says, these buildings, these stones, these beautiful foundational things, they have to be destroyed. It's all coming down. Look at the, the disciples, says, look at these stones, look at how beautiful they are. And he's like, yeah, they're not going to stand through this. The very pillars of the world society must crumble in order for the change to come. And the challenge for us is preparing ourselves for that reality. And what we know, what we know, what we're comfortable with, what we're comfortable in, what we're living in, what we're thriving in, what sometimes even we're struggling in but don't want to change it, everything that we know is going to be destroyed. How do you deal with the first aspects of change? Because they seem destructive. Change always seems destructive. It's, it's just a part of the way that it works for us, right? The things that we know, the things that we hold dear come crashing down. If you have a mess in your house, and you've ignored that mess, because you know that the mess itself, as it is, be, is easier to deal with than the mess that you would make cleaning the mess up. Because there's a lot that has to take place before the actual mess gets cleaned up. It has to get more messed up first. It has to get broken in order to fix it. What is the biggest kind of improvement that you can do in your house, right? Is it a new bathroom? Is it a new kitchen? Is it a new extension that you could build on your house? Whatever it is, the first thing you have to do is destroy what that was before you can fix it. You have to take a sledgehammer and put a big hole in your wall to build the extension. You have to crash down your cabinets in order to fix, put new ones. You have to blow it all up and make a huge mess. And if you were to stop in the middle of that mess, whoa, there is nothing more destructive than a half measure to fix something, because it just makes it worse. And a lot of times you start, and you start moving down a road, and you're like, whoa, this is a mess that I've made. There's no way that I can finish this. This is just horrible. Have you ever seen that happen? Have you ever seen that with anything? That something started, it was on the way to fix an issue, 
but the starting of it made it worse, and then you abandoned it because it was too hard. Or it got abandoned because it was too hard. That's why it's easier to bear those ills we have than fly to others that we know not of. Because the change, the, the, the thought of something in between causes us such pause. The first steps were the most costly. And they, they just didn't have the staying power to get the job done and to wade through that beginning hardness. I put in the bulletin the idea of pliable from the Pilgrim's Progress. Right? He goes with Christian part of the way. He's, he's excited about the journey that they're going on because he's been convinced by a Christian that the world, the city of destruction, is behind them and they're moving on to new places. But he gets to the first moment, the first moment of trouble, and, and John Bunyan calls it the slough, the slough of despond or whatever. The, they're stuck in the swamp of sadness. And Pliable quits. He's like, I, I didn't sign up for this. It's too much for me. It's, I was better off in the city of destruction. So he goes back. Now, we should have seen that coming, right? Because his name was Pliable. <laughs> right? In other words, he had no resolve. He was changeable. He had no perseverance and no stick to it <laughs> Which is a pretty cool word. Stick to itiveness was not changed by spell check when I typed it. Stick to it was, but stick to itiveness was a word. Kind of weird to look at, but there it was. When the going gets tough, the pliables, they move out and they quit. But when the going gets tough, those that have resolve stand form, firm. Shakespeare puts it the same way in Hamlet. I just quoted earlier part of this same speech, but he says, the native hue of resolution, in other words, our born-in ability to make decisions, the native hue of resolution, is sicklied over, it means that it makes sick, with the pale cast of thought. We start to think about, can we do this? And great enterprises of pith and moment, with this regard, their currents turn awry and they lose the name of action. But they never get started because... What are you going to do? Sometimes when you get going, when you get things going, when you start to make changes, it's going to be difficult. So Jesus here says, look, this temple, these beautiful stones that have stood for hundreds of years, everything in them, all these amazing buildings, all of these structures, all of these institutions, are going to have to shake and fall to the ground and be destroyed so that the new can come and replace it. As if he is asking, disciples, can you make it through that destruction? Or will you fall away? Can you make it through the fact of everything <clears throat> being destroyed in order for it to be rebuilt? Or are you going to see that and lose faith? Remember Jesus telling Peter, I have to be arrested, I have to be taken, I have to be crucified. And Peter saying, no, these things can't be. Jesus says at that moment, get behind me, Satan. And because that's really the satanic voice. It's not the scary voice, it's not that. It's not that. It's an, it, Satan's voice isn't even an intimidating one. It's just the voice that says, you don't have what it takes to get through these first steps. You don't have what it takes. It doesn't matter anyway, so just, you know, go along. You probably should put your head in the sand and quit. That's the void. Because change is too difficult. Change is, is structures and buildings and temples falling down. And you have to get through all of that and you have to keep on. 
It is why Jesus says at another point, and it's also there in the bulletin, the cost, the carrying your cross. You see that at the end of that verse there? For if you lay the foundation, you are not able to finish it. Everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. I get it, it's going to be hard, but not just that count the cost ahead of time, not so you can quit, but so that you can muster what it takes to get through that initial first few steps, because those first few steps are the hardest. The first few weeks of a new diet. The first exercise session that you had to do, the soreness that you feel that next day, I, that remembrance of that soreness, I, it keeps me from ever doing that again. <laughs> I see those pictures of Lindsay and Steve and Charlene, and I'm just like, man, you guys are awesome. <laughs> and, but once you've gotten through that first initial couple steps, it makes the rest of them easier. There is a sense that if you can make it through that initial pain and sustain yourself, then you will have a new habit that will be so much better. At least I've heard that's the case. <laughs> the temple has to fall in order for a new to take its place. And many are not willing to face that. The Pharisees are certainly not, certainly not willing to face that. The other leaders are not willing to face that. They have way too much to lose. They don't want to live in that mess, right? They don't want to, they don't believe in the new kitchen enough to see their old kitchen destroyed. It makes them uncomfortable. It makes them worried about where all of this is headed. No, we can't do that. Let's hold on to what we've got and let's stop Jesus and this nonsense. We've had a crazy two weeks since this election that's just happened. And there's certainly a push for change and there's certainly a push to to get rid of the corruption that used to be. But the question always is, are we just going to replace corruption with more corruption? Are we going to place this with that? Are we going to actually stay the course? Or the moment when the economy or something else takes a downturn in order to take an upturn, are we going to punt and just take it over? Do we have the stick to to take the hard line? probably going to get worse before it gets better, if it's going to get better at all, but do we have the strength to take that course? Think about the Israelites being set free. The first thing they say, wasn't it better back in Egypt? But what would they be going back to? That's the other big piece. What would you be going back to? What was pliable going back to in the city of destruction? What are the Israelite slaves going back to when they go back to Egypt because they're no longer the slaves that they used to be obedient they're the slaves that had rebelled and left and then they're coming back having rebelled and left probably not the easiest life to go back to but you see that's the part A part of it right you get moving in one direction and then you turn back, and that's been going on for 2,000 years of Christianity. Get moving in one direction, fear, turn back. One of my favorite quotes in all of Christian history is from G.K. Chesterton when he says that the Christian ideal has not been tried um, and found wanting. It has been found difficult and never tried. The Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting, it is that has been found difficult and left untried. So there's a sense that you start it, start going down that road with all of these great Christian principles, and then the world shows up and you're like, whoa, this is different than I thought of, and I'm out. Think about the pilgrims coming to America and saying, we have no king but God. And then within a generation of being here and having to deal with all of those problems, they're all of those kingly kind of rules start to show up within their own society if they had rejected. There's, a, there's one thing being a separatist on the edge of the colony, on the, on the edge of the kingdom, and then all of a sudden being in charge of the colony. It's harder to rely on God when you're in charge because of part A. 
difficulty comes fast. But a lot of people like to jump past part A and focus on part B. Listen to what the disciples say right in this. As, the, as Jesus was leaving the temple, one of the disciples, disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. Jesus said, Do you see all those great buildings? Not one stone here is going to be left on another. Everyone is going to be thrown down. That's part A. The world shaking, the beautiful being thrown down part. Part B, though, is all that anyone sees. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us when these things are going to happen. And what will be the sign that they will actually be fulfilled? Let me know when. Let me clear my calendar. Let me make sure that I am out of town while the house is being renovated. Let me know when. That's what we're concerned with. Not the overall presence, not the overall fact of being kept aware and kept in function, but when. When is this going to take place? People are so sure that the time for this destruction is now. Right now. Aliens coming out of the water, world being flat, people going crazy, this, that, and the other. The time is now. It's obvious that the second company com coming is upon us. Go to the bookshop store in the Christian section, and how many prepare for the apocalypse because it is imminent is the case right now. But the truth is, if you went there 20 years ago, those same books were still there. If you went there 100 years ago, that's where all the books were. So at what point do you... <laughs> at what point... My favorite is the Jehovah's Witnesses, right? Like, there's a sense that they, the founder of Jehovah's Witnesses, had a date in the 1800s when he said the world would come, when the end would come. That date has come, that date has gone, and yet they're still knocking on doors. And the charlatans are selling those books and making the prophecies and proclaiming the fear. And people follow like sheep because it seems so exciting and it's, they seem so sure and it always seems like it is right now, right now, right now, buy my book. Like I said earlier, it's every generation. It's as if, it's kind of funny. I used, we used to make fun of the news. It'd be like, major danger happening. Learn how to protect yourself at 11. You're like, but it's like five. I gotta wait six hours? <laughs> How am I gonna protect myself until 11? It doesn't take too much either to spur those fear, right? Discomfort, high prices, seeming craziness and disorder around the world. But zoom out a little bit, right? On 2024 compared to what? I don't know, the Civil War, maybe? World War II? The bubonic plague? Can you name a time in history where it seemed like it was much worse than now? We always want to know when. Jesus said to them, watch out, that no one deceives you. So the first question he says is there's going to be a lot of people that are going to tell you that this is when. He says, the first says, you're asking me the question when, the first thing I'm going to say is watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name claiming I am he and will deceive many. When you hear wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginnings of the birth pains. Now, there's been 2,000 years of those birth pains. Wars and rumors, wars and kingdoms against kingdoms. The kingdoms that were in existence when that was written have long since come and gone. These are the beginnings of the birth pangs. We've been in labor for quite some time. Does it seem like it gets worse because we start tearing down our idols, but then we get scared and turn right back to them every time? The, the tearing down of idolatry is a difficult thing. 
It seems to get worse before it gets better. We start to tear down those idols, but then we get nervous and we put them right back in place. Has this happened again and again throughout history? And is that why it seems like there's this endless cycle where there are these fits and starts where it almost happens and doesn't, where there are partial measures that go awry, that there is this, we start going down one path and then we switch to the other path, that there are great ventures, but there is not the staying power to make it through, the faith to sustain us through. There are great miracles and inspirations and moments of faith, but they are followed by the mess, and we can't handle it. So head back to our idolatry like a frightened turtle going back into its shell. There are many people today saying that the end times are coming. The big question is, what are they telling you to do when they say that? Is it to have faith and trust in the amazing power of God? Or is it something else? If it is to have faith and trust in the amazing power of God... They're on to something. If it's something else, I wonder. Jesus says both parts. Part A, that the first steps will be the most difficult. And part B, that most people will not interpret any of those events appropriately. Right? Those are the two things going on here. Number one, it's going to be hard. And number two, when it gets hard, there's going to be a bunch of people with information that's not going to be correct. There will be many who claim the truth, but who are completely wrong. Stay vigilant. Know the truth. Do not be deceived. And persevere through what comes. Jesus says to be constantly on edge. Be constantly watching out. To understand and be awake and alive and watchful. But listen to what Hannah prays. Charles read this. Listen to what Hannah prayed. My heart rejoices in the Lord. In the Lord my horn is lifted high. My mouth boasts over my enemies, for I delight in your deliverance. There is no one like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. Do not keep talking so proudly or let your mouth speak such arrogance. For the Lord is a God who knows, and by him deeds are weighed. The bows of the warriors are broken, but those who stumble are armed with strength. Those who were full hire themselves out for food, but those who were hungry are hungry no more. Those, she who was barren has borne seven children, but she who has had many sons pines away. The Lord brings death and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and raises up. The Lord sends poverty and wealth. He humbles and he exalts. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes and he has them inherit a throne of honor. For the foundations of the earth are the Lord's. On them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful servants. But the wicked will be silenced in the place of darkness. It is not by strength that one prevails... Those who oppose the Lord will be broken. The Most High will thunder from heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointing. God's in control through all of it. And our response should be faith, not fear. It should be perseverance and steadiness and resolution not taking one step and turning back. When Jesus tells us to weigh the cost, he's asking us to check our faith. Do we have faith to make it through everything we know being turned upside down? Part A. And if part A is there and you have faith in, this, in the message, in the messenger, then you don't need to know when part B will be. When doesn't matter. Hold the course, hold the line, 
and stay faithful throughout. Let us pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, and he speaks the same truth that is found throughout, and that is your sovereign power. Things change, old is destroyed, and the new comes to fill those shoes, all under your watchful design. Help us to hold fast throughout whatever comes, holding on to the faith that it is from you and from your gift, that as the things that we hold so dear are shaken and destroyed, that we know that what's behind them never will be. May that hope, may that faith, may that truth sustain us through whatever comes, knowing that we are secure in the hands of the one who made us all. We pray for those surrounding us in our community. We pray for our nation. We pray for the world. pray that peace will prevail even if the beginning of that peace is messy. We pray for those around us who are sick or injured, who are suffering loss, who have a great need for healing. May they know your presence, know your power, and persevere through whatever comes. We take this moment of silence to include anyone whose name we would like to be a part of this prayer. Shirley Paul. Lisa Mazzella. Almighty God, we know your power, we know your truth, we know that your creative hand knows us so well, that you, split, you, you pieced us together in our mother's womb. You know us inside and out, and you know our thoughts. 